uh, no, um, lecture this morning, the title of the Inventors in and Coding during uh, PhDs, Chickens and Shark will be delivered by Professor Rose Bannon. So, um, before that, I would like to uh, explain a bit about the background of our uh, speakers today. Um, so, uh, Professor uh, Rose Bannon, after working at the Melbourne University Department of Surgery and Research Centre for Cancer and Transplantation, Roy Rose joined the University of Queensland in 1982. So, as a National Head and Medical Research Council of Australia, uh, he undertook studies towards in PhD in Department of Physiology and Pharmacology. He was awarded at um, National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia Fellowship uh, taken up at the University of California, Santa Cruz. So he returned to the University of Queensland in 1993 to take up the um, National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia. He was Senior Research Fellow at the Cooperative Research Center for Diagnostic, playing a key role in the development of novel mutation detection and sequencing technologies and filling several patterns. He is known internationally for a key contributor to the molecular endocrinology, uh, which is a co-discovery and characterization of the growth hormone receptor and molecular diagnostic. He has published more than 100 refrigerated papers and book chapters and has filled numerous patents in those areas. He has also published in the fields of biotechnology education the business of biotechnology, technology transfer, and innovation. So his current research program is in the area of new diagnostic platform technologies, infectious, infectious disease diagnostic, virus discovery, and antibody engineering for diagnostic and therapeutic application. He has an extensive national and international collaboration network within industry and research institute since 2000. Uh, since 2000 Rose has co-held consecutive ARC linkage grants, NHRMC development grants, and grants in teaching and learning. Rose is currently Biotechnology Program Director at the University of Queensland, Australia, and is responsible for the undergraduate and postgraduate teaching programs in biotechnology. So without delay, I invite uh, Prof. Rose to give a lecture this morning. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind uh, introduction, Harrison. I think I should write a shorter biography for myself. <laughs> so the person introducing me doesn't have to speak for so long. Thank you, Hessian, for the introduction. I'm sure for, uh, for the uh, welcome today. Uh, thanks also to Professor Aziz, with whom I had uh, some uh, email correspondence. And I had some excellent discussions yesterday with uh, Excellent discussion yesterday. Is this one on? Uh, there we go. I had some excellent discussions yesterday also with Professor Samidi uh, and with Dr. Lee and with Dr. Schwen in, in the Bioproducts uh, Institute for Bioproduct Development. Uh, and I realize that there's quite a very wide range of uh, technologies and a wide range of research interests. So. It's really impossible for me to be all things to all people, so I'm going to give the core talk today about some things that might be quite new to all of you here, some fairly advanced work on antibody engineering, and biopharmaceuticals, which is really the latest generation of uh, engineered pharmaceuticals. But because of the discussions I had yesterday, I've also added on an extra session at the end on some work I'm doing on topical magnesium, that is, magnesium salts applied to the skin, uh, looking at the mechanism and the involvement of magnesium salts in inflammation and skin disease, because uh, I know Professor Samidi was very interested in that area, and also some of the products coming out of your Institute for Bioproduct Development are about topical, topical formulations of cream, so I thought some of you may have an interest in uh, that area. I'd also like to add that I've had uh, many Malaysian students over the last four or five years, and at, at one stage, uh, 
two or three years ago, almost half of my second year class came from Malaysia, um, including Nuzatil, who, who I'm now co-supervising with Harrison. Um, and uh, all excellent students, very attentive and very smart, and they all perform very well in our biotech classes. So uh, it's a great pleasure to work with those students. So I'd better get on with the talk in case we run out of time, but uh, there's a picture of the campus uh, in September. It's a very beautiful campus. It's a very large campus and very attractive, uh, as is UTM. I was uh, completely unaware of the size and the, uh, the uh, beauty of the uh, UTM campus. Uh, but we also have a beautiful campus with lakes and fountains, and in September the jacaranda blossoms come out and it looks really beautiful, so it's a lovely place to work. Very lovely place to work. It's probably, uh, of all the campuses I've worked at, and I've worked at several universities around the world, I would say it's uh, probably the, the equal most beautiful campus that I've seen, uh, along with uh, the University of California in, in Santa Cruz, which sits on Monterey Bay in the Redwood Forest. But this campus would break uh, right near the top. So about my university, founded in 1910, around 45,000 students, so it's a big one. Uh, around 4,000 PhD students and um, around 11,000 international students. We're ranked in the top 50 worldwide, uh, or the top 100, depending on which of these ridiculous indices you choose to look at. And it's a founding member of the group of eight universities in Australia, that is the so-called Sandstone Universities. Uh, it's in the top top three universities in Australia, uh, ranks with Sydney, Melbourne, and Queensland. The top University of Queensland, the top three. Seventy percent of all university-based research is done at UQ in Queensland. Ranks as number one in Australia in the value of the Australian Research Council industry linkage grants. And I am one of the founding members of the Australian. Infectious Diseases Research Centre, which is actually a virtual research centre because it brings together researchers from multiple institutes on and off campus. And since around 2003, there's been a massive increase in the infrastructure and building uh, on our campus. We have the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology. Uh, where some of the uh, bio, bio, biopharmaceutical and recombinant antibody production is done. Institute for Molecular Biosciences, the Queensland Brain, and Brain Institute, uh, two medical research institutes across the river, the Diamantina and the Translational Research Institute, where sit some of my research, my PhD students, vet school, the clinical research institutes, and of course the uh, faculties of health and science, the public teaching hospitals are affiliated to the University of Queensland, so there's the World Brisbane Hospital, the Mark Hospital, and the Princess Alexandra Hospital. Okay, we have uh, many international students. In the past, we've had many students from India and uh, China, uh, some of whom go on to do PhDs at the institutes. That's Uru Malik, who came from India, went on to do a PhD at the Institute for Medical Bioscience. Richard Sangania uh, went on to do a PhD at the Diamantina Institute. The Diamantina Institute is where the uh, well-known cervical cancer vaccine uh, was developed by Ian Fraser. So today I'm going to talk and try and cover these three topics, different aspects of antibody engineering. Firstly, dendritic cell antigen discovery using shark antibody fragments engineered dendritic cell antibodies for manipulation of the immune system or for prevention of host transplant graft versus host disease. So uh, using these engineered antibodies to prevent graft rejection after transplant. The common antibodies from chickens for detection of banana viruses. And this one which I have tacked on the end because of the special interests of this um, uh, university looking at the role of magnesium salts metabolism of human epidermal cells and using fluorescence lifetime uh, microscopy.
the rest of the slide time to mention quite possibly. So most of you will, will have run into this. This is a cartoon of the classical antibody structure. They're divided into domains. The variable heavy domain, variable light domain, constant light, constant heavy, constant heavy two, constant heavy three. These are the regions that interact with the cellular mediators of immunity down this end of the antibody. And up this end is where we have the specific binding to the target ant antigen and interaction with epitopes on the antigen. And these tight domains are actually made up of what are called beta barrels, four, three arrangements of beta sheets and the loops. The loops on the end of these barrels are the complementarity determining regions that actually contact the antigen. Okay, the first generation of engineered antibodies were really monoclonal antibodies that were invented by Kerler and Milstein back in 1975. Um, in Australia, I was one of the first generation of scientists working with monoclonal antibodies, so I started to work with these back in 1980, so it was quite close to the time that these things were invented uh, out in the public domain. Kerler and Milstein did not actually patent monoclonal antibody technology, which meant that this platform technology was there as a launching pad for a whole range of therapeutic products and for a whole range of improved, improved technologies which have, have been patented. Um, monoclonal antibodies are produced using hydrogroma technology. You take the spleen or peripheral blood monocytes from immunized animals, you fuse them with immortalized cells called myelomas, and you can produce a single clone producing an antibody of, of unique specificity which is theoretically immortal. So you can have an unlimited and theoretically indefinite supply of a particular very well characterized therapeutic or diagnostic reagent. However, these, there is a lot of art in producing monoclonal antibodies and it is expensive and time consuming and I have burned up in my younger days, many holidays and many late nights being a slave to monoclonal antibody producing hydrodomas. And the big problem, of course, for therapeutics is they are not human. So you cannot inject these into people more than once because you end up with a massive immune response called a hammer response or a human anti-mouse antibody response. Well, there, are, there is one therapeutic antibody that is a, a mouse monoclonal, it's an anti-OKT3, an anti-CD3 antibody, which knocks out both T and, T and B lymphocytes, and it, it is used to prevent acute graft rejection, but it can only be used once, because if you try to use it a second time, the body mounts an enormous uh, hammer response. The first generation, of the next generation of uh, recombinant antibodies was these things are either FABs or SCFBs. SCFBs just have a variable heavy and variable light domain connected with a synthetic linker, usually a glycine serine repetitive linker. These are constructed by recombinant DNA technology. They're the smallest functional VHVL domain. They retain the entire antibody binding site, so they retain the tip of the variable heavy and the tip of the variable light domain. So they mimic uh, basically an FAB Fragment. FAB fragments are problematic because they still possess disulfide bonds. And that is a problem when you're trying to produce these using bacteria or mammalian cells. You need to get direct refolding of the disulfides. These can be produced by microorganisms. They're relatively, the SCFEs are relatively stable, short manufacturing time, and uh, uh, they stable, unlimited supply of antibodies. The next generation of technology was the chimeric antibody. Chimera meaning a mixture between things from two different species. Where we could make monoclonal antibodies, and this is from a publication by myself and my PhD student Martina Jones in 2007. We made mouse monoclonal antibodies to a whole range of infectious disease targets, including scrub typhus, Q fever, leptospirosis, a variety of other disease markers. 
And then you can use recombinant DNA technology to take just the pieces of DNA coding for the mouse variable heavy and mouse variable light, and using splice overlap polymerase chain reaction, these DNAs can be grafted, grafted onto the DNA encoding these constant regions. So what we made is an antibody that was mostly human, but the variable parts were mouse. Okay, and uh, Martina also made a single chain version of this chimeric reagent. So the purple piece was human, and the murine part is just, just the end, variable heavy variable. And there are actually many licensed therapeutics in this format. There are now uh, more than 20 recombinant chimeric or fully humanized antibodies out on the market, probably close to 30 as I speak. Uh, the reason we were making these was that I was collaborating with a company uh, called Anbio, and they needed control reagents for their diagnostic tests for a disease called scrub typhus. And they were manufacturing a whole range of enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays. So these are assays that are done on plates. The infectious disease antigen is coated onto the plastic plate, and then you can put some some blood, some serum from the infected person onto that plate, and then you can put a labelled antibody on top and you can detect the concentration of the antibodies to the infectious disease antibody. The problem for any diagnostic kit is that you must have a positive control reagent. So you need a negative control calibrator and you need a positive control uh, calibrator for your diagnostic test. The problem for many infectious diseases is that human serum had to be used. Now using human serum for a control is bad news because your supply is unreliable and it's difficult to import human serum into Australia for many diseases that are not endemic to Australia. So what we wanted to do is use this antibody to mimic the antibodies that we would see in human serum. So we could then take normal human serum from a healthy person, we could add this antibody in and it would look just like an infected human serum. And in fact, when we uh, compared our serum positive with the little black squares here and diluted that out in our ELISA test, compared with our engineered chimeric antibody, it behaved exactly the same as serum. So that was great. It meant the company, company could substitute our engineered humanized antibody into human serum and it would behave just like human serum. So it had a reliable, reproducible, positive control. So that's a non-therapeutic application of a, a human antibody, a humanized, partly humanized antibody or a chimera. And uh, I'll just show. This is an example of some of the antibody-based therapeutics that are now approved by the FDA and the TGA in Australia for therapeutic use. There's the murine monoclonal anti-CD3, OKT3 for acute transplant rejection. But these are just a few of the well-known antibody therapeutics. This one is relevant to the talk I'm giving a little later this morning. This is also used for, for preventing graft rejection. It's an antibody called Campath. It's a fully humanized antibody which destroys uh, by uh, ADCC, antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, kills TNB lymphocytes and prevents graft rejection. Um, but there are several, several others for non Hodgkin's lymphoma, breast cancer. This is a very famous one. Perceptin is used uh, together with chemotherapy for treatment breast cancer and these others. So there's a lot of them out there. How long do I have to speak this morning, by the way? Half an hour? Half an hour. Oh, yeah, sorry. Get moving. So this is the uh, antibody structure in different species. So you probably all be familiar with the range of classes of antibodies in human all have two uh, 
uh, heavy chains and light chains. Chicken is unusual, it has a, a form called IGY, which is secreted into eggs. So you can actually, I find this really fascinating, and you can look on YouTube, you can actually uh, vaccinate chickens, you can collect the eggs, crack the eggs, collect the yolks, and purify the antibody from the yolks, which I think is fantastic. Um, now, sharks are really fascinating because they have this single chain uh, structure called an IgNAR, an immunoglobulin new antigen receptor, which consists of just two heavy chains. So this has great potential for <coughs> antibody engineering applications. And there is one other species which also has a single chain antibody structure. And it's quite bizarre, but it's an example of convergent evolution. The uh, other species which has the single chain, as well as the cartilaginous fish, uh, we have camels have the single chain antibody structure. And uh, all of the antigen binding activity is in this very small 15 kilodalton domain up here. So this is potentially a great tool for therapeutic production because we have a heat stable, very compact uh, binding domain. So. We set out to use these uh, shark antibody domains to discover new antigens on the surface of dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are crucial for antigen presentation in the immune system, and they also have a critical role, critical, critical role in transplant rejection. Uh, these are the people involved in that work. The reason we were using shark antibodies is we thought we might be able to discover antigens on dendritic cells that could not be discovered using mammalian antibodies. We'll come into that a little later. So we're aimed to prevent graft versus host disease. Now, after leukemia treatment, people with leukemia are irradiated and have chemotherapy, and then they need to have their immune system replaced afterwards by what is called a hemopoietic stem cell transplant, okay, from another human. Now the problem with that is that after the uh, hemopoietic stem cell graft, the genetic dissimilarities cause um, a graft versus host disease where residual activated dendritic cells activate donor T cells coming from the graft. So after irradiation and chemotherapy, the residual dendritic cells in the recipient in the tissues become activated and then when the T cells come in from the donor, they get switched on. There's massive release of cytokines and graft, graft rejection ensues. So it results in inflammation of skin, liver, gastrointestinal tract. Can be prevented by T cell depletion using an anti-CD52 antibody. The problem with that is this antibody, anti-CD52, destroys of all T and B cells so that it weakens the immune system and the recipient becomes vulnerable to reactivation of viral infections or susceptible to other infections. And there are no T cells left to fight residual cancer, any cancer cells that are still hanging around or that come back. So what we aim to do is specifically deplete activated dendritic cells by using dendritic cell specific antibodies. Um, and this humanized CD83 antibody, which was made by one of my PhD students. So the aim is to discover new target molecules on the surface of dendritic cells and develop humanized anti-TC antibodies. There are some of there is one of these commercially available already, anti-CD44, but we want to discover new antigens for different subsets of dendritic cells. So here's a picture of a donor C cell T cell coming in, in the graft. Here it is being activated by dendritic cell. And this is the aim of our work, to knock out the dendritic cells. So we aim to use shark antibodies to identify novel targets on immune cells, use these humanized shark antibodies to treat graft versus host disease. These are the sharks we were using, a very beautiful shark, about a metre and a half in length, called uh, the wabigong shark, that's the, the Aboriginal word for the shark. With the larvas on us. Very beautiful sharks. They don't attack people, although they do bite if you're not careful. Okay? 
So there is the uh, conventional antibody, 150 kD. The smallest fragment is the 25 kD SCFV. There's the VNAR fragment, single domain in the shark antibody. Soluble, stable, and can be expressed in bacteria. The structure of the variable region of the shark antibody, they have very long complementarity determining regions. Very long CDR3. This is presumably to compensate for the fact that there's only one heavy chain and all of the binding affinity has to reside in that single pack molecule. So the CDRs have evolved to be longer. And because of those long CDRs, we anticipate that we will be probing different surface structures on the dendritic cell. So probing more deeply into crevices on the dendritic cell that might not be seen by mammalian antibodies. We have a couple of... Oh. So there's some uh, marine science students catching the sharks It's not a good place to swim. This is on Stradbroke, Stradbroke Island. This is the University of Queensland uh, Morton Bay Research Station. And uh, each year we take our new intake of biotech students on a little induction camp out there. And there's one of the sharks in the holding tank. One stage we had three of these going. I think that sharks are not very smart, but actually they can learn the footsteps and they can tell the difference between the person coming in to give them food and the person coming in to give them injections. <laughs> and uh, they come to the top of the food and they run away and hide if they recognise the footprints. Sharks are actually quite easy to work with compared to, say, camels. Camels um, can kick in all directions and they're very difficult to work with, difficult to desensitise. <laughs> Uh, whereas sharks, surprisingly, are very easy to work with. They can be dropped into a bath of anaesthetic, and because the skin is quite porous, they go to sleep in the bath, and then you can give them the injection or take the caudal blood, the blood from the caudal vein. And then you can just take them out and uh, flush the water out of the bath with fresh water, and they come back, back again. So they're really quite easy to work with. Okay, so that's the age to not identify. So we already have made antibodies to CD83 and CMRF44, but we wanted to try and find other markers because there are multiple sets of dendritic cells in the human expressing different markers. So because you've knocked out one set doesn't mean you've knocked out all of them. So to do this, we used a method called FARS display. So it's a method to screen antigen-antibody interactions by using bacteriophage. So, which provides a direct physical link between the genotype and the phenotype. So our shark antibody library is expressed as a fusion on the P3 protein, on the pillars of the phage, on the end, and it's physically connected onto the body of the phage, and there is the DNA cloned in to the phage vector. We use a vector called PCANTAB 5E. We clone in the DNA from the, taken from the shark spleen or from the shark lymphocytes, clone it into the phage, and you can see that if this pillus binds onto the target antigen, so you take millions of phage, flush them across a plate with your dendritic cells on the bottom, and if these stick onto the dendritic cells, you can wash away all the phage that do not stick, and you've captured the DNA that's coding for that uh, antibody fragment which is binding your antigen. So it's a really clever way of connecting the phenotype with the genotype. Okay, so we immunize sharks using dendritic-like cells, KMH2 cells, and L428 cells. So these are cell lines that express markers characteristic of activated dendritic cells. OK, 
Okay, so we express the shark uh, new antigen receptor as a fusion on the gene free protein. There's the phage mid uh, encapsulated in the phage. This is the sequence of the P cantab 5E phage mid, and there is our, this picture shows an SCFV fragment with a variable heavy and variable light, but in our case we just have the single gene encoding the shark neuroantigen receptor, encoding about 12 to 15 kV fragment. And there's the uh, gene 3 encoding the, the pillars, and there's a thing in here called an amber, there's a codon in here called an amber stop codon. That means that it can either be read as a stop codon or as an amino acid, depending on the bacteria into which this plasmid is transfected. So if you transfect this plasmid into a suppressor plus strain, like XL1 blue or TG1, the different kinds of E. coli, you will get a full length phage, the whole body of the phage, plus the gene three pillars, plus the antibody fragment, all as one large, one large entity, continuous fusion between the P3 and the antibody fragment. But if you express this in a suppressor minus, you end up with this being read as a stop codon, so you end up with a truncated truncated protein which is just the VNR or the SCFV and as I, you can then express these in E. coli and do binding studies on just this small fragment. But for the selection of the reactive VNRs or the reactive uh, SCFVs, you collect all of your phage from the, the library from the shark, you wash them over the antigen on a plastic plate and you collect the ones that stick. You wash away the ones that do not stick and you do this over and over again until you enrich the subpopulation which binds very strongly onto the dendritic cells. It takes seven or eight weeks to get an immune response in a shark, much slower than in humans where you get a strong response after a couple of weeks. And we tested the response by spiking the immunogen with a known antigen so we can track, track the response to our known antigen and know that sharks were producing an immune response. This is just a dilution curve of the shark serum against our known spiking antigen. Okay, so we take peripheral blood cells or splenocytes from the shark, extract RNA, reverse transcribe it uh, into a VNR repertoire, clone all of these millions of different segments from the shark spleen or the peripheral blood lymphocytes into our phage bed. There we have the rescued phages in a uh, suppressor plus strain bacteria. We can look at the diversity of our phage by simply doing a restriction enzyme uh, digest and looking at the different restriction patterns using an enzyme called PDE1. So, you extract the DNA from your phage, you just treat with a restriction enzyme, and if you get lots of different patterns from your sample of phage, you know that you have a good diversity in your library. Okay, so we go through several cycles of selection. It's our phage library. We bind it onto the plastic plates coated with our dendritic cells, our KMH2 cells. We wash, some of them stick. We re-harvest, we then reinfect and do three or four rounds. So you go to the library, make the phage, do round one selection, harvest the phage that stick, make more phage, do round two and do these selections over and over again. So you're using an accelerated artificial selection to pull out the reactors. But you need to be clever. So as well as doing a positive selection for the binding to the cells that you're interested in, we also do a negative selection against irrelevant cells. So we did a negative selection against non-dendritic cells, these U937s. They do not express antigens characteristic of activated dendritic cells, non-dendritic cell lines. So first of all, we depleted the phage by binding to these irrelevant cells. 
We then threw away all of the fires that stuck to the irrelevant cells, took the ones that remained in the supernate, and then did a positive selection on the dendritic cells. So we did this cyclic negative and positive selection. Okay, and these are on different scales, but with each round of selection, you end up with more and more fars sticking onto the dendritic cells. So the scale here is one unit. The scale here is 90 units, and that, that is the number of fars from the first round down here. You can see that we're getting many more after this. The, this is after the third round of panning, and this is after the fourth round of panning. But when you assess clone diversity after each round of selection, you can see that diversity is gradually dropping. So this is a restriction fragment um, checking the diversity of the different members of your FARS library. You can see that by the fourth round, they all look the same. So there's really no point proceeding any further with your selection after the third or fourth round because your library diversity is starting to diminish. Okay, so we then um, check the binding of our selected phage to the dendritic-like cells, and it was checked by fluorescence-activated cell sorting. So we put dendritic cells into the facts with our phage, and then you use a fluorescent antibody to detect the uh, tags that we have on the phage. And you can see that as we go through one, two, three, and four rounds of selection, we are getting more and more binding of our phage onto these KMH2 cells. So the large peaks show you that there's a large amount of phage binding and a large amount of fluorescence on the surface of the KMH2 cells, whereas against these 293 kidney cells, there was no increase in binding. So this tells us we have an excellent population of phage binding onto our dendritic cells. We then sequenced, selected and sequenced several different clones and found that we still had some diversity in the CDRs. This is the complementarity determining regions of the phage one, two, three. We then subcloned from the PCANTAB vector into a, an expression vector PGC. These expression vectors put tags, the MIGHIS tag, onto the end of the VNAR sequence and a leader sequence at the five prime end which directs secretion of the uh, VNAR into the periplasmic space of E. coli. And uh, these are six clones, approximately the right size, that bound strongly to the AMH2 cells. We actually validated the specificity of 10 clone clones by FACTS, fluorescence activated cell sorting, using the soluble E tagged VNARs and the pink. Pink peak shows the strong binding of each of these clones to the dendritic-like cells, and the blue cell shows the much weaker binding to the non-dendritic cells. And there's a, a, a western blot showing the correct size anti-C-MIC antibody recognizing the tag on the VNAR, around 15 kilodaltons for these expressed VNARs. This is a testing the specificity of the solubly expressed VNARs against the, the blue here is the KMH2 cells and the red is binding to the kidney cell. So we then took these clones and did some immunoprecipitation from dendritic cell membrane preparations to try and identify the antigen that was being recognized on the surface of the dendritic cell. We did that by taking our dendritic cell membranes and biotinylating them. We then bound our VNAR fragments onto these cell membranes and analyzed the cells. Um, okay, we then used protein G beads to precipitate the complex between our VNAR and the uh, antigens from the lysed cell membranes. So you have the lysed cell membranes labeled with biotin VNAR binding onto the biotinated membrane, pulled down with protein G, you then denature these and run them on an STS page gel. Okay? And 
we did find that we could precipitate some unique bands from dendritic cell membrane preparations. And there's one example there, clone A6 pulling down a unique band. Okay. And we've also characterized the subsets of cells to which uh, our clones bind. This is clone C4 VNR binding predominantly to CD14 positive. These are just names for antigens on different subsets of cells. And the CD14 cells are similar to precursors of macrophages and dendritic cells. Okay. But very poor binding to CD3s, which are the T, T and B cell, T cell positive. So. Okay. So what we are now going to do, and we've only started to attempt characterization of these using uh, mass spectrometry. So we will run these on gels and then elute them from the gel and then fragment them and put them through mass spectrometry. And that should give us a peptide fingerprint which will tell us the identity of these antigens that are being recognized on the dendritic cells. Okay? And these VNARs can also be humanized, so the variable domains can be put into a human framework so that they look like human antibodies. You can fool the human host that they're a human antibody and they can be used as a therapeutic in the long term. So most of this work was done by Kathleen Brait, a postdoc who came to me from Belgium, an expert on single domain antibodies, and by a student of mine from India, from Chennai, called Kekini Tapan. Okay, so do I have time to talk about the second, second thing? Okay, so I want to talk about uh, engineering dendritic cell antibodies for prevention of graft versus host disease. This was work done by, again, another of my PhD students, Therese Selden, in collaboration with the uh, UQ Mata Research Institute and Derek Hart at the Anzac Institute. So, Mature dendritic cells do express activation markers, some um, known markers, CMRF44. Uh, we don't know the chemical nature of that antigen, but we know it's upregulated in activated dendritic cells. CD83, which is a peptide antigen, CMRF56. Okay, so what Therese did is she used a non immune human SCFV fast library. So from human peripheral blood lymphocytes, an entire repertoire of variable heavy and variable light encoding DNA. So DNA from the lymphocytes that encoded the variable heavy and variable light were amplified using special PCR primers that can amplify the whole repertoire of variable light and variable heavy. And all of those pieces were cloned into phage to form um, a non-immune phage library. Non-immune because these were taken from humans who had not been immunized by dendritic cell antigens. But the beauty of this technology is if you don't have to immunize, because the diversity is all there. It's a needle in a haystack. In our spleen, we have many millions of different antibody fragments and these mutate and change and generate incredible diversity. And we don't actually need to immunize using this method. We can post select. So there's the fast library. It's called the Sheets Library. This library was panned. Um, when you have your antigen, this is the protein antigen as a fusion protein in the CD83. This is a marker switched on in activated dendritic cells, not in resting dendritic cells, because we're only interested in killing the activated, or you might say the angry dendritic cells that are going to cause problems with graft versus host disease. So we panned these fars. We washed the fars across the plate with the antigen. The word panning, uh, do you know where that comes from? Anyone suggest where the word panning, the jargon that immunologists use when they are Yes, from gold mining. When you put the soil from the riverbed into a pan and you put the water and wash it around, throw away the light soil and the heavy stuff is at the bottom. So 
that's the analogy with uh, searching for these fars. So some of these fars stick onto the CD83. Okay. Okay, and when these were selected, the, the strong binders were selected, and then these fragments were put back into a human framework. Now there are commercially available vectors that allow very rapid reformatting of mouse variable regions or chicken variable regions or shark variable regions can be very quickly cloned into these vectors. It's called the MAP Express system. And you can convert these into a human backbone. Okay. Now this system was actually invented by two of my students, by Therese Selden and Martina Jones uh, invented this cloning system and it's now commercially available. Okay, so it's, click, it's really a click and go system. It uses PCR where adapters are put onto the end of the variable region. And then it's not restriction enzyme de dependent, it's a recombinase dependent system where recombination happens between the ends of your product and the, the plasmid into which you are cloning. And there's a publication on this in the Journal of Immunological Methods. There's Martina, who is my PhD student, went on to be a postdoc at the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology. And Therese, who is now in a senior position at a company in Seattle called Immune Express. So you can look that up in the Journal of Immunological Methods. It's a, really a click, what you would call a click and go method for changing a non-human antibody into a human format. And this uh, humanized antibody was tested for activity in a mixed lymphocyte reaction to see if the antibody would inhibit uh, the mixed lymphocyte reaction. A mixed lymphocyte reaction is really a proxy for testing for graft rejection. If you take lymphocytes from two people, uh, they're not twins, you take two people, Lymphocytes from two people, purify them. You irradiate one set of lymphocytes and you leave one set alive and viable. You mix them together in a plate and you can measure the reaction between the two sets of lymphocytes. And if there's a very strong reaction, it means these two people are not going to be very compatible for transplant. Okay? Whereas if there's a bit weak reaction, they will be. So we wanted to test if this humanized anti antibody could block the mixed lymphocyte response. And in fact, we found that the polyclonal anti-CD83 was very effective, and the 3C12 was reasonably effective at blocking that mixed lymphocyte response. So that was looking encouraging, but not quite as potent as the polyclonal antibody. And this, this is a rabbit antibody. It can't be used as a therapeutic in humans, so we need to make uh, a humanized monoclonal or a mixture of humanized monoclonals that can replace that antibody. And then, but this was also tested in a mouse model, a human peripheral blood uh, monocyte transplanted skid mouse. So this is a severe combined immunodeficient mouse model. It's an off-the-shelf standard immunodeficient mouse. These can be used as a model for uh, graft rejection called the xenogeneic graft rejection. So the mouse has had its own immune system ablated. You can then transfuse them with human peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Now what happens is that the mouse mounts a massive graft versus host reaction. Okay, so it mimics what happens in humans if they have a rejection reaction after transplant. And the green, you can see the green line is the, uh, the uh, untreated, the control, RA neck, and they all die very quickly, within nine or ten days. But in the presence of the polyclonal anti-dendritic cell antibody, which is killing the activated dendritic cells, most of the mice are still alive by day 30. So it seems to be quite effective. With our engineered antibody, okay, it works, but not as well, nowhere near as well as this RA83. So we said, okay, we need to improve this antibody, improve its affinity so that it might work as well as the polyclonal RNA-3. 
And we did this using yeast. This is where the yeast comes in. And it's called yeast light chain shuffling. So we have, this time we have a library of random variable kappa sequences from a human, from a non-immune human library. It's a random assortment of VKs cloned into this yeast expression vector. And the backbone of this vector is the heavy chain from the antibody which we have made. So this is the heavy chain of our 3C12 antibody, combined with about 10 to the 7 random selection of VKs. So just as we did with the phage display, this time we we're expressing these on a yeast cell, and then we pan the yeast cells against the antigen and see which of the yeasts are sticking onto our target antigen. And by that approach here, you can see the yeast cells with the, the uh, heavy and light change expressed on the surface. So the individual SCF3 antibodies are expressed on the surface, about 10 to the 5, 100,000 copies per cell. And then we put these yeast through a fax machine, which is basically a capillary with a laser, and we can measure two different fluorophores. And we select those yeast which have very high antigen binding, and also have C terminal expression of this tag called SF SV5. This tag just tells us that we have a full length antibody fragment and not a small fragment. So this is what the expressed SCFV looks like. There's a tag on this end which tells us we have a full length SCFV, single chain variable fragment. The antigen sticks on here and we use another antibody to detect the binding of antigen. So by detecting this signal and this signal, we can detect if we have a full length SCFV on the surface of the yeast. So the yeast system has a lot of advantages, but the, uh, by putting these, transferring these clones into a tryptophan deficient medium, only the transfected cells can multiply, and then we, when we further transfer them into an induction medium, we can express the uh, SCFV on the yeast surface. So I won't dwell on this too long, but to say we tested several clones of yeast and found that we could select um, this one here, which had high affinity binding to the antigen as well as full length expression, so the top right hand quadrant. And then this was tested on the biocore, and it was shown that the affinity of the yeast shuffled antibody was more than 20 fold improved. So the dissociation constant was decreased by about 20-fold, or the affinity was increased 20-fold. And then when we tested this in our mixed, uh, mixed lymphocyte reaction, which I described before as a proxy for graft rejection, we found that the engineered antibody, this is the wild-type antibody, not yeast light chain shuffled, inhibited some of the mixed lymphocyte response. The engineered one, purple one was much more effective. Okay, there's the negative control along the top. We then tested this in the mouse model of xenogenetic graft rejection and found that the engineered antibody was much more effective than the uh, non-engineered antibody. So there's the wild type 3C12 humanized antibody, blue. Okay, and there's the engineered antibody for EC12. So you can see that the, many of the mice survived out to day 30, and it was at least as effective as the polyclonal rabbit antiserum in prolonging the life of these grafted mice. And we also did a dose response with different doses of this light chain shuffled antibody, and we found that we got a, an increase in activity with increasing doses. And in this experiment, the uh, mice were more healthy and we had a, um, almost 100% of the mice still living out of 30 days with the higher doses of the engineered antibody. So we seem to have succeeded in producing a reagent that might be effective in blocking graft versus host disease. This engineered antibody, the 3C12C, is going to be taken into phase one clinical trials. Uh, humans, which is good news. Now, 
instead of talking more about antibody engineering, I was going to talk about chicken antibodies. But because I've been speaking so long, chicken antibodies to banana viruses, which were produced by exactly the same means that the antibodies were engineered from chickens. And then fast display was done on virus extracted from banana leaves. Bananas are a big industry in Australia, as I'm sure they probably are in Malaysia as well. But, uh, Jenny Vo, one of my students, was successful in using fast display to produce a whole range of fires recognizing different types of banana virus, banana streak virus, LL and dolphin virus. And she also mapped antigens onto the surface of the uh, banana streak mysore virus coat protein. And these are antigens recognized on the surface of the banana streak virus coat protein. And she used some of these antibodies to decorate the surface of the virus to show that they could bind to the capsid protein on the surface of the banana streak mysore virus. These are all the people who work in the shark VR and antibody engineering work. This is Kathleen Braid, who has now gone back to Belgium. Hekadi Kupan, who went on to do an infill at, at ANU. Jenny Vo, who did the banana work. That's my team as it was in 2010. It's changed a little bit since then. Actually, uh, a student from Malaysia, Russ Rumley, also worked on the banana virus work and did some superb work with Jenny Bo. I'll very quickly talk about this work on mag topical magnesium salts because I know some of you are interested in these things. It's a project I started a couple of years ago. It was initially in collaboration with a swimming pool company. Um, we're no longer collaborating with the pool company, but I'm continuing with this fundamental work because it's very interesting. We're looking at the role of magnesium salts in skin repair and anti-inflammatory effects. And we're using a very novel microscopy uh, technique called fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy and dual photon, dual photon imaging, which means you use two lasers and you can focus them at different levels of the skin very small region and you can measure the concentration of NADH or NADPH in very specific layers of the skin. So it's a very powerful method. It uses what's called quantum harmonics. It basically means if you, when two, pro, two photons come together from two separate lasers, they combine to increase the local frequency of those photons. So you can use two low frequency lasers in the near infrared and excite at a much uh, higher frequency, very locally within the skin. How did I get interested in this? Well, when I was, that's not me, but when I was a little boy, I spent much of the first three years of my life in hospital. And this is because there were no steroids. I'm pretty old. In the late 50s and early 60s, we didn't have the miracle drug of steroids. and I suffered from terrible dermatitis all over my body and there were no steroids so I was in hospital a lot and lost a lot of fluid through the skin I thought I was going to die but what happened in the end is that a young doctor who had been in the US was one of the pioneers of dietary manipulation and she came back and tested removing different foods <coughs> so she took away cow's milk and eggs and other things and they discovered that I had a severe egg and cow's milk allergy, so they took me off those foods. And instead of having me locked away in dark hospital wards, as they used to do, they stuck me out in the sun on the veranda. And of course, the UV has great, within the correct dose, has great healing powers on the skin. And that, that fixed me. And then later on, steroids came along and probably kept me going through my school years, even though I still had to be tied hand and foot when I was uh, near the end of my exams when there was a lot of stress in high school that came back again. And I had to be tied hand and foot, so I would pour off my skin, even with the steroids. So this gave me a particular empathy for this particular project. This is the Dead Sea, looking across to Jordan, across the Dead Sea. Okay, 
many people go there to bathe and be healed by the uh, waters of the Dead Sea. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence about miraculous cures happening from bathing in the Dead Sea. So Dead Sea therapy is one of the oldest forms of treatment for skin disease and chronic inflammatory disease. But almost nothing is known about the mechanism by which this could be worked. Diseases like arthritis, psoriasis, eczema, and even neurological diseases. People have claimed that their Parkinson's disease has abated, or even their Alzheimer's, their memory has improved. So lots of anecdotal evidence, but not a lot of rigorous clinical evidence, and not much on the actual mechanism or the changes in inflammatory mediators that might be happening in the skin. So, but it is certainly known that skin integrity is now thought to be, it's known to be critically involved in allergy and atopic marks. So if you have cracks in the skin, breaks in the skin integrity, you can get massive escalation of allergy, not just in the skin, but throughout, throughout the body, because the dendritic cells and keratinocytes, langan cells, and all of those other immune cells are in the skin. And they can release mediators that can spread and have effects on the nervous system and everywhere in the body. So there is some clinical evidence so studies by Proch have shown treating one arm with Dead Sea Salt Solution and the other arm with tap water, significant improvement with reduction in atopic dermatitis. And uh, skin biopsies after treatment with Dead Sea Water from psoriasis patients showed significant reduction in numbers of activated T lymphocytes. So there's quite a bit of evidence now that magnesium is capable of permeating the skin barrier, at least at elevated temperatures. And if there are breakages in the skin, certainly the magnesium ions will get in. But there's a paucity of information in the literature regarding cascade of molecular events during uh, hypomagnesemia. So, and certainly illnesses related to inflammation following chronic or acute hypomagnesia systemically are well documented, both in rats and humans. For example, there's evidence that hypomagnesia is associated with diabetes, okay, with insulin resistance, and with um, atherosclerosis um, is associated with hypomagnesia as well. So the aims of Navin's project, what are the underlying mechanisms that, uh, by which magnesium can play a role in regulation of inflammatory response? What is the extent of magnesium involved in inflammation and skin repair? That's the structure of the skin. Um, stratum corneum is, under normal circumstances, is a seal, but in disease states or at high temperatures, can open up and be uh, permeated by ions. Uh, the keratinocytes constantly differentiate, come up here from the basal layer and replenish the upper layers of the skin. Okay, so we've used. With, human subjects and we've done tape stripping. So zones on the forearm were stripped up to 20 times to disrupt the stratum corneum. We use um, student, student volunteers who receive some reimbursement to have their skin stripped 20 times and go through the experiment. It's not a life-threatening process, just a little bit of irritation. And it's, they think it's worth it to get their coffee vouchers and things like that. Then we measure transepidermal water loss, which I know you do here in some of your labs. Uh, skin hydration using a polyometer. Uh, measured daily before treatment and over seven days as indicators of subcutaneous of uh, stratum corneum recovery. And we performed phlegm fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy on different layers of the skin over a period of 1, 5, 24, and even up to 96 hours with and without treatment with magnesium salts. Um, these are some technical details on the flim, which I won't go into. This is the experimental design, where we have little plastic chambers. So the skin is stripped uh, 20 times in each of these zones, and then little plastic chambers are placed on top of the skin. The little plastic chamber has magnesium salts, and then the arm is placed directly under the microscope for the fluorescence. Laser energy. There's one of our 
happy volunteers sitting for an hour or so with his arm under the, the microscope. And we measured the change in transepidermal water loss over a number of days with and without magnesium. And you can see that with magnesium, the recovery um, back to normal of the TWL is quicker than with just plain water. In this particular experiment, there's a problem with the baseline at zero, but we've done this one now many more times with more subjects, and this result is holding up. So the magnesium at around 1.8 molar, the concentration of magnesium salts in dead sea water is at least 1.5 molar. It's about 30, about 33 grams per litre of sodium and about 35 grams per litre of magnesium salts, but it varies a lot. It's at least 1.5, so we use 1.8, 1.8 molar. We've done this many times now, and this is a consistent effect that the magnesium does um, accelerate the recovery back to normal of TWL, which reflects the integrity of the stratum cornea. And we also looked at the hydration, hydration index. And again, you can see here the baseline is good between the treatment and the non-treatment groups over seven days. And you can see that the magnesium resulted in a more rapid recovery of the normal skin hydration using the quantiometer measurements. So measurements were taken at 22 to 23C, relative humidity greater than 50%, 20 tape strips on three test points, one hour treatment with water and magnesium solution every seven days. With the phlegm, we used the uh, dual photon imaging at intervals 0 to 24 and 96 hours in the tape strip skin. And we looked at the uh, fluorescence lifetime uh, in the layer of skin we were looking at, the measured fluorescence is dominated by NADH or NADPH. Uh, the fluorescence lifetime and also the ratio alpha 1 on 2, which is the ratio of bound, so-called bound to free NADH. An increase in the alpha 1 to alpha 2 ratio is associated with cells undergoing oxidative stress. And you can see these orange patches indicate the oxidative stress in the tape strip skin uh, over a period of 96 hours. And the idea was that we would look at the effects of magnesium. But here you can see 24 hours, 96, uh, 24 hours, 96 hours. This is the uh, fluorescence lifetime changes in the normal skin and the tape strip skin. This is 0 to 24 and 96 hours. And you can see there are some differences between the normal and the tape strip skin in terms of the fluorescence lifetime. And when we looked at the ratio of free to bound in ATH, the alpha 1 to alpha 2 ratio is dramatically perturbed by 96 hours, 24 hours. You can see the difference between the tape strip and the non tape strip skin. So there's a dramatic perturbation of the NADPH bound to free ratio as a result of the tape stripping. A big shift here. We wanted to see if the magnesium salts on the skin would make any difference. Um, this is the fluorescence lifetime of the NADPH. This is the uh, water. This is the magnesium. And this is the brown is water, the purple is magnesium. And um, this is with the no tape stripping in green. Okay. Now that initially looked quite promising and we looked at the change in the alpha 1, alpha 2, the bound to free ADPH and in preliminary data it did look as though the magnesium was causing a reduction in the alpha 1, alpha 2, so reducing oxidative stress. Unfortunately this result has not held up over time. We haven't seen a significant difference in the alpha 1, alpha 2 ratio. So the preliminary conclusions are that the, based on the TWL and the skin hydration, the subcutaneous barrier at the test sites treated with magnesium recovers more rapidly after seven days than water and air treated sites. So the magnesium is having a beneficial effect on the skin repair. Um, 
Although an increase in alpha-1, alpha-2 ratio is seen in the tape strip, tape strip skin, indicative of oxidative stress, the treatment with magnesium did not have a significant change in this ratio compared with water after 24 hours. But taken together, these results suggest magnesium chloride treatment leads to an increased rate of skin uh, stratum corneum recovery after damage induced by tape stripping. So we'll be doing more, more studies on this. And where we're heading with this is that we will look at a panel of pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines in the skin with and without magnesium by RT-PCR, first transcription PCR for gene expression in the skin and immunocytochemistry. Uh, we'll also be measuring magnesium effects on dendritic cell populations in human PBMC. So this is a connection with the other project that I'm doing on activated dendritic cells. The cells that we harvest to use in the other work can also be used in this study. And we'll be measuring cytokine secretion and looking at changes in surface marker expression and the composition of the cell population using fax analysis. So we'll look at direct effects of magnesium on isolated peripheral blood mononuclear cells and also look at their inflammatory cytokine expression to try and get at the mechanism by which magnesium can uh, modulate the inflammatory response. There's some references and the work on the Magnesium work has been done in collaboration with the Translational Research Institute at the University of Queensland. Mike Roberts, who is the director of the Therapeutics Research Unit, Jeff Grice, and Levin, who is my, one of my current flock of PhD students. Again, Levin came to me from Chennai in, uh, in India, and he won a UQ International Scholarship to do this work. And I've gone way over time, so I'd better stop and ask for questions if you're not completely exhausted. So, does anyone have any burning questions they'd like to ask? Thank you so much, Prof. Yeah. Well, very wonderful uh, and informative uh, lecture today. Long. Oh, very long. <laughs> okay. So I can conclude that uh, from the lecture we uh, know about the uh, the selection of the engineer antibody, the mechanisms, uh, the source, and also the role of the magnesium uh, that beneficial to our skin. So uh, I would like to invite all of you to ask uh, questions. Anyone? Okay, Prof. Thank you very much, Prof. for for this very uh, rich lecture for us. For a long time, but I work for, for many years for a long time, but I have a lot of production. And um, you mentioned that it's okay, the new generation of one plant but it's, uh, it's for it's going to be produced and expressed in equalized carbon and whatever. For new research, you mentioned that if you have one fewer one plant but it's under clinical trials. We'll be going into phase one. Yes, phase one. 3C12. 3C12C. Engineered. Piece of light chain <coughs> shuffled yeah. Is this one is produced in Sakara cells? Uh, it is. It will be produced in Cho cells. Yeah. yeah. Before I ask, because yeah. of, to the best of my knowledge, yeah. the mass of therapeutic monoclonal antibody should be expressed in the immediate cell yes. by the factory. Yeah, like, because of the folding problems. Yes, and yeah. the glycosylation. The glycosylation. Which is very important because yeah. the tail end of the antibody is glycosylated. Uh -huh. That is what binds onto natural killer cells. The CD16 plus cells have the FC gamma receptor, uh -huh. and the glycosylation can affect that quite dramatically. In fact, we've also treated that antibody with kyphernosine, uh, which blocks glycosylation, and we get actually get enhanced binding onto the NK cell as a more effective killer. So we can actually treat Cho cells with the kyphonacine block the glycosylation and get further enhancement of the affinity of that antibody. But I think it will be Cho cells. Yeah. Is it the Cho King one or the normal Cho? Uh, I don't know. I have to look at the I have to uh -huh. read. It'll be in the the paper uh, in the Journal of Immunological Methods. Yeah. I'll have to. I can look it up yeah, for you. Yeah. Because because um for Cho, these androgenous dependent cells. 
and there is another variety, Chokki one, which is yeah. French version is even yeah. But the people claim sometimes the expression level in the Chokki one is, is less than the normal Chokki. So yes. Yeah. I, I just asked him about that, about the expression levels. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. check it out in the, in the manuscript and see. Uh -huh. uh, and you use a serum for medium? Um, they use a synthetic a serum yeah. substitute medium. Uh -huh. Yeah, not serum. Yeah. Not for the production of bioproducts. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, it's a well, I could see that you've done my clonal work because of the look on your face when I talked about uh -huh. burning up many uh -huh. holidays and nights looking after looking after hybridomas. That's actually the difference. The graph was the difference between the control and the treated. Oh, I see. So it's actually not the uh -huh. absolute hydration, it's the difference between the treated and untreated groups. Oh, and so as you see it drop, you can see the drop yeah, between yeah, yeah. the treated and untreated I just, groups. I just curious why it's You're drop. very observant. That's right. <laughs> so it's the, the, we plotted the difference. Yeah, the difference between the control and treatment gradually uh -huh. drops. I drops see, down. that is the difference. Yeah. Oh, Ah, yes, yes, there's a, antibodies are being developed for tr treatment of infectious disease. And, and a great example of that is the Hendra or Nipah antibody, where if somebody is bitten by, um, somebody is thought to be infected by Hendra, um, they can be infused with the antibody for passive protections, for immediate protection. And that anti Hendra antibody is a, a humanized is a humanized. Um, it came from phage display. I think it was a phage display human antibody, and it's being produced at the University of Queensland at the Australian Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotech. And it was used in an emergency treatment of four people who were exposed to Hendra a year or so ago. And they all they all lived, and now it's being scaled up and produced for the treatment of Hendra by collaboration with a company called DSM, which is a Dutch company. They have a factory at, across the river from the university, so it's really handy. So you can, the products can come out of the search and into DSM. But the problem with dengue is there's something about how dengue works with them being forced. Ah, right? dengue. Dengue, you're talking about vaccination now, which is different to passive protection. Passive protection tries to mimic the immune response of the human where you just infuse antibodies. The antibodies bind onto the virus and then it's cleared by macrophages or the other things that bind onto those. Vaccination is very challenging for dengue. Um, there are vaccines in trial on the yellow fever backbone, the YF17D backbone, and then they have the PRM or the E protein from all four dengues. The problem with dengue is that you must get a good response to all four subtypes. Because if you don't, you can have good protection against dengue one or two, but if you get an infection by a different subtype, you get a massive enhancement, and the disease can in fact be much worse. So the, can you not use this technology, the graph versus host thing thing on it? Um, you could tailor make humanized antibodies to each of the dengue subtypes. Yeah. And then if you knew what, then you could infuse that as a, and that's an interesting idea. I don't think it's one that's been thought of. People are all, because the problem with that approach is, with Hendra and Nipper, you get relatively small numbers of cases, maybe yeah. a handful or maybe hundreds. I know you had an outbreak in Malaysia, Nipper, and I think it was a couple of hundred cases. Yeah. Whereas with dengue, 
you've got 50 million cases of dengue, so you can't go around to each person and treat them with it. It's just unfeasible and way too expensive. So you have to have a mass vaccination program, which is relatively cheap. So it's not a question of theoretical or technical feasibility, it's a question of economic economics and practicality of getting that treatment out to people. So you could say Hendra and Nipper is really a boutique disease. I hope it stays that way. That's a good question. They're two very good questions. Best criterion. The best criterion is that it works. <laughs> okay, so you need to make it look human as much as possible. That's a given. There are a lot of new technologies coming on. Some of these tri bodies and some of these things that use novel domains of protein A, these three domains of protein A, and lots of other antibody mimics. The problem with those is you lose the effector functions of the antibody, because the antibody is not just antigen binding, it carries all of this other ammunition, uh, complement pathway, binding to NK cells, transport across membranes, and all of that other stuff. So rather than try and do better than nature, it's best to hitchhike and try and use what's already there. So once you've humanized, the key thing is that it works in your functional asset. So you test it in the mixed lymphocyte reaction. Um, We've shown that the effects in the mixed lymphocyte reaction and in the mouse skin model are mediated by CD16 plus natural killer cells. Because when you ablate those, or when you remove them, it doesn't work anywhere near as well. Um, and if you make this engineered into an IgG4 rather than an IgG1, it doesn't work because the IgG4 constant region doesn't bind to the NK cells. So you need all that stuff. But the acid test is, does it work in your functional assays? Does it work in the animal testing? Um, that's the acid test. So rather than starting with what we can engineer in, you make it human, you use the right classes, and then you put it into the testing systems and see if it works. And then you've got to hope that it's not toxic when it's being eaten. But based on the track record of humanized antibodies, you have a reasonable of confidence that it's going to work. The other issue is that this is working in the human mixed lymphocyte culture, but when you actually put it into the whole body of the human, you don't really know what's going to happen. Yeah. I'm glad you're all awake, that's great. Sorry, I tried to squeeze in a lot of information. Thank you again, Professor, for giving a very very good uh, lecture today. And uh, I think that the information given by Professor is very uh, helpful and very good for the uh, treatment or inclusion of the chronic disease in the future. So we really hope that you will visit us again and have a some collaboration with us in the future. Thank you, Tom. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you. Of course, you can tell them that my lectures at home only go to yes, <laughs>